The skull consists of the cranium and the facial skeleton. The cranium is the bony container for the brain and the foundation for the facial skeleton. The cranium is made up of a number of originally separate bones. These lines of fusion, known as sutures, show where the bones are joined. Next, we'll look at the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone forms the bony prominence of the cheek. It also forms the lower lateral part of the orbital margin and this part of the lateral orbital wall. The zygomatic bone extends backward to meet the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, forming the zygomatic arch. Now we'll move forward and look at the maxilla. Here's the maxilla. The right and left maxillae are joined together in the midline. On each side, the maxilla forms the lower medial part of the orbital margin and almost all of the floor of the orbit. The maxilla bears the upper teeth. On the underside, it forms much of the hard palate. The maxilla is hollow. It contains the largest of the paranasal sinuses, the maxillary sinus. To see the posterior part of the maxilla, we'll remove the zygomatic arch. Here's the back of the hollow part of the maxilla. Down here, the maxilla is joined to the bone behind it, the sphenoid bone. Apart from this attachment, the maxilla is separated from the sphenoid by this impressive cleft, which has a vertical part and a horizontal part. The vertical part of the cleft is called the pterygomaxillary fissure. The horizontal part of the cleft is called the inferior orbital fissure. The inferior orbital fissure, here it is from in front, separates the floor of the orbit, formed by the maxilla, from the lateral wall that's formed by the sphenoid. This is the nasal bone. This is the lacrimal bone. The two thin nasal bones form just the upper part of the bridge of the nose. The structural supports for the projecting parts of the nose are made of cartilage, as we'll see later. The little lacrimal bone forms the most medial part of the inferior orbital margin. This opening between the lacrimal bone and the ethmoid bone is for the nasolacrimal duct, which takes tears from the corner of the eye to the nasal cavity. Last of all, we'll look at the palatine bone. Here's the lower part of it. On each side, the palatine bone forms the posterior part of the hard palate and part of the side wall of the nasal cavity. We'll get a better look at the palatine bone when we look at the nasal cavity. So is the floor. By contrast, the lateral wall is marked by a number of features, most notably by these three delicate bony projections, the conchi, also known as the turbinate bones. This is the inferior concha, this is the middle concha, this is the much smaller superior concha. The three conchi partially divide the air passage into three parts, the inferior meatus, the middle meatus, and the superior meatus. Here's the back of the orbital cavity. Below it is the hollow space in the maxilla, the maxillary antrum, which we'll look at later. At about the level of the floor of the orbit, the nasal cavity becomes much narrower. The narrowing is caused by the presence of this collection of small hollow spaces, the ethmoid air cells. We'll see more of these in a minute. To see more of the septum and the nasal cavity, we'll look at it in a skull that's been divided just to the left of the midline. Here's the bony part of the nasal septum. It's formed by this part of the ethmoid bone, the perpendicular plate, and by this small bone that we haven't encountered up till now, the vomer. The lowest part of the septum is formed by the maxilla and by the palatine bone. Here's the the part of the maxilla that bears the teeth is called the alveolar process. We'll look at the teeth later in this section.
the alveolar process ends behind at the tuber. Now we'll bring the mandible into the picture. The mandible develops from two originally separate bones, one on each side, which fuse together here at the symphysis. The mandible is described as consisting of the body and the right and left ramus. The corner between the ramus and the body is the angle of the mandible. The rounded projection that articulates with the temporal bone is the condyle, or condylar process. The narrowing below the condyle is the neck. The sharp, slender projection in front of the condyle is the coronoid process, a major muscle attachment, as we'll see. The dip between the coronoid process and the condyle is the mandibular notch. The angle of the mandible is roughened on the outside and on the inside by the insertions of a matching pair of muscles, the medial pterygoid on the inside and the masseter on the outside, which we'll see shortly. The body of the mandible is described as consisting of the base and the alveolar process. The side of the body slopes upward and inward, slightly on the outer aspect, markedly on the inner aspect. The posterior part of the alveolar process bulges medially above this hollow, the submandibular fossa. This projection in the midline is the mental protuberance. On the inside, this roughened area is the mental spine. Two pairs of muscles are attached here, the geniohyoid and genioglossus muscles. On the inner aspect of the mandible, this thickening below the coronoid process is the buttress. In the middle of the ramus, level with the tops of the teeth, is the mandibular foramen. Just in front of it is a small upward projection, the lingula. The mandibular foramen is the start of a tunnel for the inferior alveolar nerve and blood vessels. A major branch of the nerve emerges on the outside at the mental foramen.